Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 628, that's 628 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever you may find this lovely jubbly pod. How am I? Pretty well, all things considered. I'm a little bit bummed because this weekend I was meant to be in Berlin, so I was meant to be flying out this Friday, but unfortunately other things have come up, other life events have probably pushed that back for a considerable time, maybe I'll have to go in the new year sometime, maybe before March, hopefully fingers crossed that can be done, but I was really looking forward to this weekend's lineup, man, the lineup is so bleeding good, and it happens also to be the 18th birthday of Berghain, and you know how much I love that place, I speak about it ad nauseum on this pod to the point where I'm pretty sure I've lost some listeners because of it, but I don't care, because I love that place, so um, that's a little bit of a bummer, but apart from that, I can't complain, I'm in good health, I'm in good spirits I'm drinking loads of waters I'm doing some green juice here and there I'm drinking loads of cold brews and I'm enjoying my time on this spinning ball going at 150 miles an hour probably faster than that but you get the drift you get the drift so randomly today I was just thinking back to the game the other day between Portugal v Switzerland where Portugal eventually won 6-1 pretty I think run under mill performance they were able to dismantle Switzerland even though they made quite a few considerable changes or none more so than dropping Cristiano Ronaldo and there was a lot of fervor a lot of kind of you know panic about it a lot of talk on media about it and stuff and whatnot which makes complete sense considering the profile of the player but I'm just thinking about it from the point of view of Cristiano Ronaldo and how it must be affecting him mentally and how difficult it must be to kind of get your head around the fact that even though your brain is able to tell you or even though your brain is intuiting how to do certain things and how to respond to certain scenarios on the pitch and where to be in certain areas of the field your body or your legs just can't do the things that your mind can do it's just one of those unfortunate things that happens to athletes over the years you just see them slowly but surely not deteriorate but they so basically can't compete at a level that they were prior or they can't perform so at the level they were prior it's just one of those kind of you know sad realities of life unfortunately we all age and i think in athletic it's probably more brutal because for the most part you spend a very um you spend a very concentrated period of your time you know being the best in the world you're being looked at as some sort of gladiator as a superstar um as somebody that teams can rely on franchises and clubs and organizations and even countries cities are going to bank some of their you know financial expectation off the back of your signing and then slowly but surely those that importance slowly wanes the phone calls don't get answered with the same level of enthusiasm as before the critics start coming out ready to sort of tear you down and now you're in a position where you're having to kind of sober um, and quite cold look at your career and make the necessary adjustments in order to kind of proceed and for whatever reason it seems like Ronaldo's more than ever or more than most players out there has found it very very difficult to accept where he is at the moment I don't think it's any of a surprise especially me being a fan I think if you followed his career from the beginning you would know he was always somebody that didn't really take well to being dropped he always wanted to play every single game every single minute and if you really consider the way he plays his playing style the position that he played in at the time in the wing you know the flair that he had the skills the speed he was considerably robust in his ability to kind of avoid long-term injuries he was never really injured i can't think for a very prolonged period of time and if he was he'd always try and rush back and try and display how you know freakishly athletic and strong he was compared to other players in the same way that ibrahimovic would take pride in coming back off of a really debilitating knee injury and showing that he could still perform at the highest level despite all those kind of niggling injuries he's had over the years and another was kind of been the same sort of guy so he's always kind of put himself forward to play he's always been available to be picked and he does not respond well to getting dropped he's like the complete opposite of Donny van der Beek who at the moment Man United is going through a bit of a troubling time and probably needs a move more than anybody but Donny van der Beek a lot of people would say I would say specifically that a lot of his reason a lot of the reason why he's at the position that he's in now in United is maybe because he's not assertive enough on the pitch and maybe off the field he kind of allows his football to do the talking but nowadays you kind of have to do all the stropping and the moaning and the complaining and they're using the media as a tool in order to kind of further your message and to you know um to basically write 
you know, to basically dictate the narrative or to um, craft the agenda, wherever it may be, you kind of need to use that these days in media to kind of keep yourself, you know, in front of the competition and to make sure that your name isn't being slighted out there because sometimes public perception, especially in a court of public opinion, can really go a long way to sort of writing the narrative of who you are as a person. And sometimes you don't want that to happen, especially if you're a professional athlete. And I feel like Ronaldo does the complete opposite. He doesn't take it lying down. He's going to come out and make a stand and make a comment, sit down and interview Pierce Morgan, whoever it may be, for a strop. And I feel like throughout the entirety of the Switzerland match, I felt like to, it felt like to me, even though he presented like, you know, in a Pierce Morgan interview, that he didn't really care about how he was received by United fans or maybe by the pundits and stuff with, for his behaviour in terms of leaving the stadium early and whatnot and throwing a shop on the bench. It felt like he didn't really care, but I felt like after that Piers Morgan interview, um, with the reception that he kind of received from, you know, professionals far and wide and uh, people, you know, outside of the kind of, you know, sicker fans that are his fans on Twitter and social media and whatnot, I think it was a bit surprising and maybe somewhat sobering for him to see so many people basically say, hey, we get what he means, but he was still out of line for doing X, Y, and Z. And I feel like he was on his best behavior when he was on the bench at Switzerland. He really made, um, uh, no, V Switzerland, sorry. He made, he really made a big, big effort to not really throw a strop when, um, you know, when, um, what do you call it? When Portugal scored their goal, especially the striker that replaced him, he made a real big effort to go over and celebrate with the team. He tried his best not to look sad or pissed off on the camera. Whenever the camera panned him, I guess because of the screen in the stadium, he quickly fist his face or made sure he wasn't looking too stroppy. When he came on, he put a proper shift in. Um, he obviously was trying to score really, really hard, which he always tries to do. But I think even now it was probably, you know, mo really on his mind, especially with the striker that replaced him scoring a hat-trick. And he went out of his way to kind of be the best behavior after the game. He did the same thing, but you could kind of see underneath all that if you played team sports long enough you know the dynamics of a club you know the dynamics of teams you know the, you know the kind of you know the, the type of personalities you kind of come across and you know when somebody is trying to act like everything's okay but deep down they're absolutely boiling they are red hot and I feel like Ronaldo was in that sort of state so it's a fortunate or it's a good thing that you know Portugal were able to win that game by such a big margin so there is no room for him to really throw his toys out of the pram and if anything, this could be an opportunity for him to maybe show that he's learned from, you know, his past experiences. And maybe he's got to a point where he's accepting the fact that, OK, I'm not the guy that I once was. And he's just going to sit down and kind of support the team from afar, because even though he's 38 or approaching 38, he can still help this team. This team is talented. The Portugal team is incredibly talented, incredibly versatile. So many players coming off the bench. Rafael Liao, just the other day against Switzerland, scored a superb goal. The commentators were saying it was a deflection, which they always don't love to say, but it was an absolutely incredibly cold goal in the top corner. Left the keeper completely stood still, and they clearly got a lot of options to come off the bench. I think a Ronaldo, a Hungary now, are supporting the team to come off the bench and give the opposition more trouble and more problems to kind of, you know, um, keep him under breast on because, you know, he's not going to be able to run he's not going to be able to move as fast as he did previously before but he can still finish so if you come on with 20 minutes to go and you've got someone like a Ronaldo in the box you know more than likely he's going to be able to put those goals away especially if he's got the bit between his teeth so I really do hope as a fan of his that he does kind of realize that hey I'm not the guy that I once was let me just support the team especially it being his national team it seems like he kind of gives a lot more and he's willing to kind of be a team player and there's a different side of Ronaldo he comes out like a leader like I don't know it's just a different side he kind of puts his ego to one side when he's playing for his national team hopefully um in the next game he does that going forward because you can't drop what's his name is it Ricardo I forgot his name the guy that scored the goal you can't drop him after scoring a hat-trick it's just impossible it doesn't make any sense you can't drop somebody that scores a hat trick. Um, go, go, sorry, was that Gonzalo Ramos? You can't drop him after scoring a hat trick. It's impossible, especially the kind of hat trick that he scored. All three goals are supremely taken. The first goal, obviously, being my favourite, he receives it into the box with his right foot, palms it. Well, receives it with his right foot, controls it out, and then spins with his left and hits the top corner like an incredible finish. Kind of reminding me of how. Robin Van Persie back in the day used to like smash goals in from really tight corners close to the you know nearest post an area which most goalkeepers think they can cover because there's no real room and it just went in the top corner before the goalkeeper could even react incredibly good performance clearly leading the line 
and kind of really giving the opposition a lot of trouble. And if anything, his performance really showed how the team performed better without Ronaldo because he was leaving loads of spaces behind him for players like Jao Felix, who probably had his best game of the entire competition so far, and Bruno Fernandes and all the likes to kind of pop into those spaces and obviously cause um, Switzerland a lot of damage. So I'm hoping Ronaldo can kind of accept his role and just be the mentor and the older kind of statesman that he needs to be. And maybe also this kind of experience will, I think, push him maybe to accept a deal that allegedly is on the table from that Saudi Arabia club. The numbers are astronomical. I think he's going to potentially earn something like 250 million euros or dollars or something like that. It's crazy. Something of 200 mark. And I think it's only for like a two year deal. So essentially he's going to get paid 100 million a year to go and play for the Saudi Arabia club. And you would imagine in the Saudi Arabian league, he'd most likely play every single game unless he doesn't want to play every single game, but most likely he will. So if that's the case, you can play every single game in the Saudi Arabian League. Why not go there, do your thing, enjoy your riches? And obviously, um, judging by the reception he gets from people in the Middle East in general, you saw how the media were reacting to him. Obviously, the media reacting to him is just maybe a global thing. But I think overall, from the time his face went on the screen in the stadium, the fans would cheer when he came out to do his warm-ups. People were cheering every time he touched the ball. So clearly, the reception and the love, the adoration that Ronaldo gets in the Middle East is astronomical. I'm sure he gets it all around the world, but he gets real love as a player over there. And they won't necessarily care if he's not at his former powers. The fact that he's there and he can maybe knock in a couple of free kicks here and there during the season is going to go a long way to kind of entertain the fans. And I feel like now, unless he's willing to accept that he's going to be a squad player for a top, you know, European side, which he clearly doesn't want because, you know, I'd imagine United at the current moment in our current state, we're probably the only team in Europe maybe that could offer him the potential to play more games because we're pretty shit and we only have, what, one striker in Martial who's kind of injury prone and Rashford is not really a striker. So if any team sh he should stay at and play a lot would be United, but he didn't. Ha he wasn't happy with his role there. So clearly the European thing, I don't think that's going to work out. So go to the Middle East, collect your P and keep it moving. I'm hoping that happens to him, but God almighty, man, the attention this man gets, this picture here I've got on the right on the screen, if you can't see it, it's a picture of this flood a bevy two rows actually of, of photographers i'm just seeing it now in the picture and if i zoom in there's actually two rows there's photographers standing on top of what looks like a box like a map box taking pictures and one below and they were all there taking pictures as the national anthem was going so clearly the attention this guy gets is completely astronomical compared to other players so it's maybe no surprise that he's not been able to accept his current status and position as a player because for the longest time he has been kind of treated like a footballing god and now unfortunately he's kind of you know realizing that he's human just like the rest of us which might be hard to take but i'm hoping my goat can realize that he's better being a team player and support his fellow national team members and hopefully hopefully fingers crossed get portugal over the line and have them winning the world cup because that would be amazing to see that would be amazing to see but you know you never know with this guy you never know with this guy and I went to quickly move on and just talk about this because I thought this is absolutely hilarious because I don't know I, I I wonder if it's common sense common when it comes to just you know club etiquette and what people do when they go out I know in some places or some people have this thing where they want to get guest lists to go to certain parties which is nice don't get me wrong Again, having a guest list is pretty decent but arranging it and I feel like maybe it's because I'm just generally a person that doesn't like asking for help and I kind of feel a little bit gross and a little bit cringe requ sorry, requesting things like that but just arranging it and getting it sorted unless a person is re legitimately your friend and somebody you actually know who's going out their way to offer you a guest list and say hey by the way I know you like this club I'm actually playing here would you like to come to you know to Boogie and we can have a chat and hang out and you're like yeah of course it'd be good to see you I haven't seen you in a while and I want to see you play and I want to go to this club again and then they put your name down but I feel like reaching out to people specifically to get on the guest list just feels a little bit gross, feels a little bit slimy. And I say that because I know I've done it myself in the past and it was a really embarrassing and funny story. Because I remember ages ago, this might have been like, this might have been like 2012 or 2013, long, long time ago, when I was first DJing, I got a chance to play at some art gallery, like an after party at an art gallery somewhere in Shoreditch. And um, that was when I was used to play on a flipping controller. That's how long ago it was, right? So I used to play on a controller 
and then I went to go and um, DJ at this art gallery and I was the only person playing in the beginning and then I did and then little did I know that flipping crystal clear the you know world famous DJ and producer was playing after me he was at like, the main attraction at this art gallery thing I forgot I think it was an art gallery thing or some sort of party in Shoreditch and he was playing after me so it was me little old me and art Chris, fucking Chris, crystal clear at the party and you know at the event he was really nice as clearly as you some of you probably would know him he's a pretty decent dude comes across very well on the internet and you know we were we were friendly at the event shared a couple of words and i think we maybe shared some other words on social media but that was it but obviously agostino in my head of being naive i assumed those little words were a sign of friendship were a sign of kinship oh we're brothers now we're boys and then i hadn't talked and spoken to this guy in like i don't know maybe a decade i swear to god right <laughs> That's why I know he's cringe. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to be honest. And I remember I haven't spoken to this guy in a decade. So that happened in like 2012 or say 20. I don't know what year. Just let me say it's, it's a long time ago. Then a decade goes by. And I then randomly, I think I was, yeah, that's it. Randomly, I think it was one of my occasions where I went to Bergheim. It might have been 2019, 2017 or something. Somewhere around that kind of age. So come up somewhere around that um, year range. And I was like, oh shit, Crystal Clear's playing. I didn't know he was playing. So I was like, oh, let me let me ask him for a guest list. Because I'd never been in a guest list at Bergen. I was like, oh, I wonder what it's like when you go in that other, other queue over there and you stand on the side and you get a little head nod and you go through and you get a stamp. You don't have to pay up. Oh, that'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? And you get something special. I don't know. Maybe you go for another door. I don't know. Whatever I, I was thinking. So then I go and message him about it. <laughs> and obviously I get left on scene. And then I remember quite soon after, um, what happened? Either he said something, either he tweeted something that was a bit of an indirect or Instagram post that was indirect. And honestly, I swear on my life, it snapped me out of my kind of um, neediness. It's very strange. I think that happens a lot with people because I feel like sometimes when you're requesting stuff from people and you're, and you're kind of trying to suck value from them, all you see is that they're like a value vending machine. You don't actually see the need and the want and the request that you're placing on them. You just see what you can get from them. And you're in this kind of delusion that it's all about you. And I guess at that moment also, think about this, right? This is like 2019. I think it's 2019, 2018. Let's say it's a 2019. Crystal Clear's profile has increased considerably, right? Since 2012 and 2019. He's legit like a big time DJ. That's why he's playing in Bloody Bergheim. So, you know, maybe he was with me at the fucking short ditch after parties and whatnot and gallery events. Cool. But then he way, way surpassed where I was at by the time 2019 came around. So for me to have this delusion in my head that somehow I was the only person requesting him um, of a guest list that was of merit made no sense because I'm sure he had many people in his inbox that were asking him for something in terms of a guest list. Then I remember him tweeting something or saying something. I forgot what it was. Maybe an Instagram story, maybe a tweet that was that sort of felt like a subtweet to me kind of thing, right? And I was like, oh, because about around the same time that I asked him, I got left on scene. And then it suddenly snapped me out of my delusion. It snapped me out of my kind of um, need that I had to kind of get that list. I was like, oh, yeah, that is a bit weird, isn't it? If you don't know somebody, like, know, like as, as a friend, and then you're just reaching out to them, trying to get on the guest list, like, what is that? Do you know what I mean? That's a little bit presumptuous. That's a little bit corny. That's a little bit lame. That's a little bit cringe. That's a little bit everything. And it's something that I wouldn't have done anyway in normal life. I can count on literally one hand. The amount of people I've ever asked in my entire club in history in life to ever put me on the guest list is something that I legitimately abhor. But obviously, if it was me and I was playing somewhere, you know what I mean? I'll get, I'll put everyone on there. I don't really give a crap because I don't have any friends. Violin, right? So I remember that being a thing. I realizing, oh, that's actually is quite a weird thing. And then, then I think after that is when I realized, I think I did some Googling around and I realized um, this is a common thing that happens with DJs that go play in Berghain. Because I guess it's a big, you know, it's a legendary club um, and everyone wants to kind of get in and obviously the guest list kind of guarantees you entry and a lot of people assume if you reach out to a DJ who maybe, let's say, profile isn't the biggest, you could just get on their guest list because, you know, no one knows who they are, which is ridiculous to think that because, you're again, you're placing all this importance on you. You're assuming that no one knows who they are even though they're playing one of the biggest clubs or the most famous club in the world. It's just... The, the, the irony is really you know it's not lost on me or probably lost on others but now that i see the light it's not lost on me and 
I remember reading up on them thinking, oh, right, this is an actual issue a lot of DJs face, like just getting random DMs from people. Again, don't get me wrong, I've, I've met the guy once, but we are no way, shape or form friends. Just because you played at some art gallery with somebody 12 years ago doesn't have, doesn't mean that you got, you know, any right to tell them, oh yeah, would you mind lending me a fiver? Because essentially asking for a guest list is like going up to a stranger and asking for a tenor or DMing somebody that you met ages ago, 10 years ago for a tenor. Would you ever do that? Probably not. So it's the same level of cringe. So it's funny when I stumble across posts and people talking about the whole rules around the guest list stuff, because I'd imagine for the most part, if you are going to get on the guest list, especially in a place like Berghain, the whole premise behind it is that you don't pay. It's like you're a guest of the DJ. But obviously, if you're smart, you just maybe drop the people that are going to do the searching or the entry people like a tip or something. Maybe you give them 10 euros. Maybe you just give them the 20 euros just because the guest list ent- just paid there, whatever the entry fee is because the guest list ensures that you get in. So that's just like a little thank you. Thank you so much for getting me in because I don't understand people who go to clubs with just enough money to get drunk and get high. Go to a club if you've got money enough to tip and to buy your drugs and do your you know do your drinking, but don't go there just with like oh, I've only got ten euros. Like you're an absolute psycho. People that do that, I don't know how you do that, how you survive, but good luck to you. But I would imagine if you do that, the worst question. Imagine if there's any. What's the worst question you can think of after you ask somebody for a guest list? Like imagine you go to somebody you don't know. You have, you met them ten years ago, <laughs> and our gallery that doesn't exist anymore in Shoreditch, and you ask, and now it's ten years later, and you ask them for a flipping guest list, and they legitimately probably don't even remember who you are. It's been so long, and then um, what's the worst question you can you can ask after that follow up? I'll tell you, the worst question you can ask is, "Can my friend come? <laughs> can we put my friend on the guest list too?" I would imagine most people, you know, now I, I won't say most people. I'd imagine some people would go out of their way if you ask them to maybe just put you down as a plus one because they'd assume you're going to come with a friend because the last thing they want also is for you to just tag along with them and be standing next to the booth like a weirdo just watching them play they want you to just lead them alone and do your thing and then you can meet each other later in the toilets whatever it may be but imagine asking somebody for a guest list and then the next question you ask to follow up on that is oh can you get my friend on there as well <laughs> it's a plus one actually could you put do a plus two um and then you and then you reply really late to the names all that sort of stuff i don't know i think people people's um neck and people's uh lack of shame is really incredible like i can honestly say i didn't i didn't even put it i didn't put two and two together i honestly didn't know it was going to be a bad thing when i initially asked i just assumed oh yeah i know this guy and i was in my delusion of like yeah i'm the most important person in the world and also to be fair to me i legitimately thought i was the only person i asked and then it was only doing a couple of Googles around that I found forum posts of people posting. I found people on Twitter and stuff saying, especially DJs complaining because, you know, they love to complain on Twitter. Essentially saying, oh, all these weirdos inboxing me about guest lists, like leave me alone type of thing. I was like, oh, it is kind of weird, isn't it? Asking someone you don't know for guest lists. <laughs> it's legitimately hilarious. But to be fair to the people, myself included, I think the only reason people why people do that for the most part is just a desperation to get in. Because, you know, I've been out there most recently, just in June, having to wait outside in the queue, in the cold for four hours. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't that cold in June, don't get me wrong. But still, I had to have my parker on and we were waiting for four hours. And I think that was the kind of replacement um, Club Sylvester for the last year's one. And it's not fun, especially when you're like, you know, you're seeing tons of people getting turned away because it's one thing when you go there. I've been there before when it's really rammed and they're only letting one in, one out and the queue's not moving at all no one's leaving no one's getting in that's kind of like a collective okay cool it's like when everybody gets fired in a company you can't take it personally i mean it's kind of easier to take if it's just everyone and not just you so when you're in a queue and there was no one's moving no one's getting in it's okay but you're when you're in a queue and it feels like it's moving like you know every hour but you're seeing mad people getting turned away and everyone's cutting a queue it's just horrible so i think that for those kind of i think everyone that's gone been to that club has been to a popular nightclub has had those experiences where you've been waiting outside for ages it's probably worse when you're at a really crappy cocktail bar that's also a nightclub and you have to wait for like you know more than flipping i don't know flipping one hour that's already horrendous right you're on some cobbled street with your shiny shoes hurting your soles of your feet and you're having to wait outside and this bounce is clearly letting all these hot girls in before you and these guys with money and you're just standing there 
<laughs> with your 50 euros in your pocket hoping to get in but it's even worse than your burger because the door's there you will see all the music the flipping lights through the window of panorama bar you're like oh my god please 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 so i think that kind of drives people to be desperate and to kind of do things they probably wouldn't do if they um, weren't so desperate like desperation and thirst can really turn somebody goo goo gaga and i know that for sure but i think in general the etiquette should be if you are trying to ask, or the unwritten rule should be, yet to cut an unwritten rule should definitely be, if you're going to ask someone from a guest list, I don't recommend it. Don't ask people for guest lists in general, you do, unless you know them. Just go and pay your money and go early enough. Like I've been plenty of times, plenty, plenty of times to the Bergheim early. Like legitimately, I queued up like Saturday, 10 p.m. So I could get in, do you know what I mean? Like be the first people in and the, the, dark, the flipping club is legitimately empty. It's a really nice feeling to see. You're in the main room and you see it flooding slowly but surely. It's absolutely incredible to see by 1 a.m. It's absolutely packed. But just go early enough, you know what I mean? You don't, you know what I mean? Especially if you're on holiday for, for the weekend. What's the need of trying to go there at a cool time? Especially if you're on your own, just go down early enough, hang out, you know, feel the vibe. But at least you get in early, and you or if if, if you get rejected, you get rejected early. You can make your plans to go elsewhere. And you don't have to wait in a cold for ages. But if you do ask for a guest list, allow asking for the plus one. If they put the plus one down, or call, but just assume there is no plus one. But don't you know go there and be like, oh, you can have a guest list. You get it. And oh, next message. By the way, one more thing. Can I put a plus one? Like that's real C U N T behavior in my opinion. But you know. What do I know when it comes to that stuff? And then the other thing I was thinking about that I thought was really kind of bizarre and something that needs to kind of be said that probably shouldn't be highlighted, but hopefully people just kind of know. For the most part, I think it's incredibly important if you do go to these spaces like Burkheim that kind of have this no photo policy that are intrinsically tied to the queer, in, to the queer club scene and just place where people for the most part enjoy the freedom of being somewhat anonymous and just letting all go of all their inhibitions and just going in there into the incredibly dark club, right? One of the darkest clubs I think of legit words, especially if you go towards the front. The last thing you should be doing or thinking about is, oh, if I bump into somebody who I don't know, a celebrity, should I be taking a picture or reporting back and kind of writing reports and, you know, giving people a heads up as to what happened? I know it happened already with flipping Elon Musk and whatnot. Um, with him being in a queue fair enough and get rejected but i think if you're in there you owe everybody that's in there a kind of sense of privacy um you know to kind of or just a sense of kind of non whatever that behavior that you do outside when you see a celebrity you should not do that when you're in there you should leave people the f alone just leave them alone to enjoy themselves i've seen plenty of people in there who are well known people you know from all kind of walks of life in terms of or from all kind of scales of celebrity from you know the z's to the a's and the last thing i'm ever going to go in there is kind of you know try and fan out and make it awkward for them and make them feel like they're being seen or being watched in some way someone's writing a report no 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 unless they obviously come up to you and say something which has maybe happened once before in my time and still i didn't go out my way to let them know that i know who they are just kind of had a kind of cool interaction in the toilet and kind of kept moving but i really do think you owe everybody that goes in there and yourself um just the opportunity to just kind of let go of that kind of stuff that you would do in any other place you know the, the fragrant recording that obviously you can't do the pictures obviously you can't do and just enjoy it because i don't think there's a lot of the other day i was just thinking about this the other day um because i saw this picture i'm actually going to try and get it up on here and i'll post it when i do the clip but i remember seeing this picture earlier on of um anna anna um anna Cassian, uh dasha and um chloe Savengi and somebody else and i think they went to a, a morrissey show somewhere so clearly they're all hanging out and being friends and stuff cool whatever I was just thinking about Chloe Sevenia and looking at her thinking like, you're a legit legend, a legit it girl, like a legit cool person, like an actual bona fide, cool, arty, cultured, and just, you know, person that just gets it, right? And she's been doing this for years. She's been at the height or somewhat of her career for a long time, um, influencing culture and just being an absolute icon. And for the most part, she's not the most socially, she's not the most social media active person. She's not every day posting her on her stories. She's not every day posting where she's at on her Instagram page. Obviously, there's loads of pages that kind of report and snap her, the same with the Olsen twins. But she lives a somewhat, you would steam it, anonymous life where she just kind of concentrates on her art. She looks after her family, enjoys her husband and whatnot, her friends, her social life, and keeps it moving. And I was wondering, with someone like that, 
you know, because she also she wears incredibly cool outfits. She wears incredibly cool clothes. She's, you know, going to all these cool places, getting invited to fashion shows, premieres and whatnot. But there's no inclination and no desire from her side of things to capture those moments and put them on social media. Or if she has captured them, they're for her own private collection, whether they're in a photo album or just stuff she puts on maybe a secret flipping finsta. But for the most part, publicly, especially for me being a fan, there's not much out there, right? You don't see play-by-plays of her getting dressed on the way to meet Anna and Dasha and other friends to go to this Morrissey show. You only saw that she was there because Anna posted an Instagram story of them all there watching Morrissey perform live. But for the most part, she just keeps it humble. Not humble, she just keeps it kind of, you know, cute and does her thing and maybe that's added to her longevity in the industry i'm not too sure but overall i think that's interesting and cool because i feel like the Berghain, especially when you go in places like that or maybe every, most clubs in berlin that have no fur policy it feels like it's the only opportunity similar to when you're on an airplane you know some people in the airplanes are like oh that's the only time i get to read that's the only time i get to watch a movie or whatever it may be because you legitimately don't have the distraction of this flipping bad boy right it's not distracting you for once this flipping phone that you got in your hand smartphone whatever you have it's not distracting you You get a chance to kind of you know really absorb yourself or concentrate on the thing that you're doing whether it's sleeping whether it's reading whether it's watching a movie or whatnot and i feel like when you go into those clubs you probably owe it to yourself for one moment in your life to kind of just surrender to the moment and just let go of the things that you would do outside in your normal everyday life and just kind of enjoy it in that moment the same way you go to a cinema and you wouldn't be on your phone you'd be just watching a movie the same thing you should do when you go to those kind of clubs and maybe clubs overall because i'm a big believer in you know there, there probably should be no photo policy in all clubs for the most part you shouldn't be taking videos and whatnot because if anything you don't really capture the moment anyway you don't, you don't capture anything it doesn't really represent what you're actually seeing hearing and feeling when you're actually there so why bother if anything you know how they say similar to like um when somebody's blind they have a heightened sense of maybe smell and hearing i think there is something to be said for legitimately committing to not using your phone when you're on the dance floor and just kind of committing to just mm, i'm gonna i'm gonna just enjoy this i'm not gonna have my phone i'm just gonna enjoy this and that's all i'm going to do i think that will absolutely go a long way in terms of enjoying those things and obviously when that happens the last thing you're gonna want to do is if you bump into a famous person in the toilet say oh my god i love doing this uh, i wish i could get a picture it's like no 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 maybe a little head nod if you see them passing you maybe a little dab oh my god hey what's up man whatever it may be but this idea of making them seen and stripping away their anonymity and privacy just feels gross to me in my opinion it really does feel that especially coming away with like reports of what you saw what they were getting up to it's like shut the fuck up keep it to yourself enjoy your night as they're enjoying themselves and just keep it moving for the most part i think so but hey what do i know when it comes to that sort of stuff and then that also got me thinking of this with somebody um, posted online actually earlier regarding an early i get i guess it's a, it's a beta example of an app that they're about to launch i'm not going to speak too much on it because i don't know how much this is meant to be public but i'm just going to show you a quick picture of what it kind of looks like and it's essentially an app which allows you to quickly at a glance kind of check um how long a dj has that's playing in a particular room in berghain panorama bar uh berghain obviously main floor garden and the triple x floor and essentially it's a way for you to kind of at a glance just see how long that set is going to be how long that's left in the set um you know who's coming up next or you know when you can basically pop into a room because that's usually the one thing that kind of you know is a bit hard to kind of get your head around when you finally get into the bird kind of like, okay cool i want to see this person down there i want to see that person up there i want to see this person on the main floor and you're trying to figure it out and that's the only time you kind of get out of your especially for me because i tried my best when i go in there to just leave my phone alone it's the one time even when i go but for the most part i don't post stories i'm not doing play by plays of where i am if anything i just you know or maybe take a couple pics here and there and post them when i'm back home which is quite funny some people always post up later oh are you here it's like nah mate i left already a long time ago but i was thinking about it and as great as an idea as it is because it made me just think about that stuff about you know if you see celebrities in Berghain or nightclubs leave them alone i think there is something to be said for maybe having that same sort of board that kind of shows you at a glance who's playing and what's next somewhere in that space i know maybe it'll take away from the kind of immersive nature of that club because i feel like once you walk through especially once you 
everything about it is so so ritualistic the queuing up the selection process the flipping nerves of everything going through the security the ticket going up the you know going to the cloakroom handing over your stuff it feels like you're sort of you know leaving your old self there going up the stairs entering into the sort of labyrinth and sort of walking up the stairs and boom you're sort of into this major room and you just get a slap with all this sound in your face all this bass so maybe if you had an led screen showing who was playing it'll maybe kind of take you out of it again because it's another screen you recognize it as a screen and we'll like you take out your phone or take a picture of it or something. i don't know something will happen but i feel like maybe there should be a center point somewhere where everyone could just at a glance see okay who's playing and then you can go and play instead of having it be an app i know everyone's using their phone anyway but i think that might be more beneficial because i'm not too sure if i want to have an app i'm not too sure if i want to be in app mode when i'm in there i want to kind of be in club mode and not want to use my phone not want to touch it. i just want to be immersed in the environment that i'm in and not kind of use my phone as a crux for any social occasion i have this also thing where i do when i go out especially when i go club nights and stuff i kind of want to just avoid touching my phone because i don't want to have it as a thing of whenever i feel uncomfortable i touch it instead of just talking to somebody instead of dancing or whatever it may be right i'm just going to my phone because i feel uncomfortable because i'm not sure what to do with my body not sure what to do with my hands it's like no, no 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 just chill and dance have a good time and it's really hard to kind of get your head around doing that kind of thing but i think that may be a far better way to do things than to try and be that you know happy guy on the flipping dance floor checking who's coming on and who's playing on and usually anyway if you leave at a certain time depending on where you are in the queue you could you should probably know who you want to see anyway you just have a rough idea of what you want to do um but i don't know i'm i'm, I'm in two minds about the app i like it i like the i like the what they say the the ui the ux looks really cool i like that maybe it's at, at a glance you could just quickly check it it's like a little widget fair enough but i feel like i'd prefer to just have something in the club that they would probably put up that you could just check at a glance like a little screen sort of like a departure board that you'd have in an airport that you kind of see who's playing and then go from there but i don't know if that would be a distraction you know how the departure board in the airport feels like one of those sort of like it's a moth to a flame everyone kind of gets drawn to it and just staring at it like a zombie and just trying to hope your flipping thing changes if you keep looking at it long enough maybe that might happen with a screen people just keep staring at it hoping the next person they want to see name appears on there instead of just kind of enjoying themselves so i don't know maybe it's counterintuitive but maybe it's also a sign that you know nowadays you know with the clientele changing that goes there they have different demands now maybe it's something that they legitimately need and request in order to make their experience fun and if you're a place like Burkhan and you need to make money you have to keep the lights on and pay people in terms of their wages and whatnot you maybe have to do implement these kind of new technologies to kind of keep yourself somewhat um you know with the times but i don't know i'm not sure if all those advances are really necessary but we'll see we'll see but so far i like the app and hopefully we'll see a wider release of it soon if it does i will probably do a full review here for you guys and let you know what it kind of feels like but for me personally i'll probably avoid taking out my phone and using it like that because i don't think it really serves any purpose Moving on from that one, we're going to quickly talk about this because I didn't mention it prior when it actually did happen. So as most of you are aware, Alessandro Micheli, the designer for Gucci, has unfortunately stepped down from his role, left or fired. Who knows when it comes to fashion because everyone's kind of trying to protect their reputations and not really tell the truth. But essentially after the glitz and glams of all of these amazing shows and this kind of um, quirky, kooky, ugly chic that he kind of brought to the forefront at Gucci. It now looks like he's currently going to go away. And it's weird because I feel like the last big project they had in the pipeline that sort of was presented by him or his team or his tenure was obviously the, the Palace collab, which I felt like was an incredible waste of, you know, fabric. I feel like a lot of that stuff will end up in an ocean somewhere strangling a flipping turtle for the most part. But hey, everyone needs another new hoodie with flipping, you know, some embellishments on it or whatever it may be. But it did feel like a bit of a weird cash grab, a bit of a weird um, collaboration in the first place, but to show what those two brands share in terms of, you know, customers in terms of vision in terms of appeal taste or whatever it may be but here you gotta do what you gotta do to kind of keep the youths on your side but after all that kind of glitz and glam after the show with the twins after doing a show on um hollywood walk what's that thing called um there's one they did outside in la where all the stars are um on the floor i forgot what it's called the name escapes me now but there was a lot of money put into gucci during his tenure and i think in general he did a really good job for what he presented i feel like maybe now if you're really being cutthroat just in from a purely aesthetic point of view 
maybe that Alessandro kind of um, vision of Gucci is a little bit tired now. People are maybe a little bit over the kitschy, ugly sort of nature of it, quirky, whatever you want to call it. Maybe they need a bit of a refresh, but I still did think, you know, he did an incredible job in terms of awareness of Gucci, in terms of mostly, I'd say in terms of appeal when it comes to a customer. I feel like people that wore Gucci nowadays kind of treated it the same way when people used to treat Tom Ford Gucci in terms of they felt like they were wearing a piece of armor, like it was a real luxury piece that kind of made them feel beautiful made him feel sexy made him feel cool and i feel like he did the same thing even though his clothes were far less um you know they, they didn't really have as much sex appeal as maybe a tom ford but it definitely had that cool it factor when it came to the things that he did for sure and 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 let the record reflect alessandro is definitely one of the best dressed designers out there think about the designs that come out at the end of their runway shows and what they dress like one example being the guy that i love and i'm a big fan of jw anderson you know um he also designs at luebe and i've got loads of luebe pieces i've got some jw anderson at pieces too and i love the guy the great designer clearly an incredibly smart dude but god almighty I was incredibly smart and talented, but God almighty, he has probably some of the worst personal style I've ever seen. It's always Navy. It's always beat down trainers. He always looks like he just woke up. Like he looks terrible, but of course he's completely, you know, pours all his creative juices and talents into his clothes. And then you look at the flip side, somebody like a Rick Owens, who I'm of course obsessed with. He looks incredible as well. Whenever he's coming again, at the end of the runway, he's probably the classic archetype for his own brand outside of, um, what's his face? The guy that works with him. Um, who also might be a side piece, who knows? I forgot the guy's name, but you know, it escapes me now. But he also is kind of maybe a, you know, a, a good sort of avatar for what Rick Owens do. And another world dress designer I can probably think of might be um, Laquan Smith is another one. He always looks flipping dashing when he comes at the end of the runway too. But yeah, Alessandro needs to get bonus points for looking amazing at the end of these shows. He's really, really, really well dressed. But his article courtesy of Vogue, it says Alessandro Michele is exiting Gucci after an extraordinary seven year run. It feels like it's been longer in it, but I guess that's all the resort collections. It makes makes you feel like designers have been at houses or at brands way longer than they actually have been there. It's only seven years. It legit feels like it's been ten plus. But Bamba routed. Anyway, it continues. Um Alessandro Michele is exiting Gucci. Uh, Kering announced today the Roman designer had an enormously successful nearly eight-year run as creative director that reversed the fortunes of the Italian heritage label and changed his outlook on fashion. Michele was a Tom Ford hire and worked under Frida Gianni, who was plucked. Um, she was plucked from the accessory studio by Gucci CEO Marco Bizzari, an unexpected choice if ever there was one. Early request for interviews with the scruffy hair designer who came out for his first buy in 2015, um, surrounded by his team, had to wait for the then unknown to go through media training in a statement bizarre said i was fortunate to have the opportunity to meet alessandro at the end of 2014 since then we've had the pleasure to work closely together as gucci has charted a successful path over the last eight years i would like to thank him for his 20 years of commitment to gucci and his, his vision devotion and unconditional love for his unique house and during his tenure of creative director so he was working at gucci the brand for 20 years he was definitely eight and he leaves like this uh, off the back of a massive collaboration there's not going to be a big swan song he's not going to get the benefit of having like a final show where he can come out at the end bow receive flowers and kisses from adoring fans and celebrities he just gets a social media post and a, and a pr release or something i wonder what, what that's about i wonder if this is because brands are legitimately bleeding money these houses and they don't want to put on another show essentially paying for paying for a farewell for somebody if they can just invest that into the hiring of a new person and maybe put that to their signing bonus or whatnot but i find that really really distasteful how can you be somewhere for 20 years and you get you know you get what a golden handshake via email or maybe all your login stop working one day and then you don't get the opportunity to kind of have a public farewell in the same way maybe you had like a public introduction that feels really strange so maybe there is a firing involved maybe there is something else um something nefarious behind the scenes that occurred who really knows um, let's skip this. Let's skip Riz Ahmed before he starts going into some slam poetry about you know where you're from. Uh, continues here says if Michelle was um, sorry if Michele was a shy or reluctant front man at first he made it an instant impact or he made an instant impact his first hit walked um, his debut uh, wins sorry 
his first hit walked his debut women's runway for 4 2015. That season's kangaroo line loafers had Gucci's familiar horse bit hardware, but otherwise announced that Nikkei would be taking the label in a more eclectic, eccentric direction. That's what I'd say, eccentric instead of being kooky and whatever else I was saying. Look at that. I wonder what flipping what's his face is gonna do. What's his name again? Um Jared Leto. He's probably gonna be distraught because he was a big advocate of flipping Gucci. He loved Gucci just as much as flipping Kanye loves flipping Balenciaga and Demna. He was always wearing that stuff to the point where you felt like he wasn't just getting stuff sent to him. He was legitimately spending some of his own money and buying Gucci and really kind of going the extra mile to kind of show the love and appreciation, which is definitely something you'd love as a designer. You get someone on board, you pay the money to wear your stuff, and then they're actually going out of, you know they're going out of their way to buy more stuff that they want and with their own hard-earned money because you'd imagine some of these celebrities you know they're probably even though they earn a lot of money they probably are a bit tight with the stuff that they end up going to buy because they get stuff so free for so often in it but one incredible look here both of them wearing for met gala 2022 says um from the get-go he establishes a magpie aesthetic lifting literally from you um you name the decade and time expanding style and ushering in an era of gender non-conformity that continues today while growing a loyal fan base and a usual figure of hollywood um in the process you know what as well to be honest to yeah, that's a good point to give him props that non-gender conformity thing or that gender non-conformity thing was really cool and he did it in a really kind of matter of fact casual non sort of uh, bells and whistle type of way there wasn't a big announcement there wasn't this you know huge manifesto it was just him sending clothes down the runway that looked like it could be worn by a man or a, or a woman right as simple as that there was nothing else in between it was just like whatever you know in terms of a masculine feminine look he went to go for but there was this there was no real clear line between what was men's what was women's and i loved it just in a subtle sometimes just a subtle introduction of a really um high heel on the loafer or some really tight trousers or a little crop top or some lace little things here and there that kind of gave you the idea that hey that top could actually look good on a woman it'll actually look good on a, on a, on a guy also it continues um Da, da, da. Michelle's singular vision seduced the likes of Jared Leto, Michelle's doppelganger, Dakota Johnson, Billy Eilish, Harry Styles, whose collaboration with designer Ha 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 recently arrived in stores. But yeah, Harry Styles is definitely someone who's going to be distraught too because he loves Gucci. He's always head to toe in that. His stylist is always putting him in some fresh looks for that also with his tour. In him, perhaps they saw a kindred soul. He studied costume design at Rome's Academy of Costume and Fashion. In any case, he cultivated a tight knit group. His Gucci family was a merry band of artists who wore their hearts, sometimes literally on their sleeves that maybe explains the whole theatrical nature of gucci shows and whatnot and how extra they were and how yeah the extra theatrical and also i wonder if this kind of basis or this kind of training as a costume designer similar to what matthew williams was prior right matthew williams um used to be a costume designer if i'm not mistaken for lady gaga when they used to date back in the day which is basically his first introduction to making clothes so that you know you would imagine maybe led eventually to weirdly enough to bin trill that then led to elites and then led to him doing um obviously Givenchy at the moment i wonder if there's something about doing costume design we having to kind of invent these you know costumes essentially for a particular um show whatever it may be or particular performance out of your you know out of thin air maybe taking inspiration from some fashion pieces but you kind of get your ten thousand hours there and you're working really to tight deadlines you're having to nip you know edit things cut things trim things you know maybe cut and sew things maybe cut and paste things i wonder if that is part of some of the special sauce some of the you know the extra level the guys who don't, maybe don't do conventional fashion training in terms of doing an ma you know in terms of a ba doing you know fashion design or whatever maybe a pattern cutting maybe doing costume design might be a good way into it i'm not too sure who knows but anyway me me comparing Mich <laughs> um, Alessandro Michele to Matthew Williams is definitely going to get some people hot and bothered anyway but hey continue Michele had a flair for rule breaking hookups there was a full 2021 hacker project with his caring stable mate um Demna for Balenciaga which I think might have spelled the end of collaborations for me that might have been where I like you know I'm tapped out with these collaborations I'm done because I thought that was god awful. There were some bags that were pretty decent as well, um, but for the most part, I thought all of it was horrendous. Um, and some of it, and for the most part, I think similar to what that Gucci, like I said, Gucci and Paris would probably end up the same way. That Balenciaga and um, Gucci stuff hasn't aged well. You look back at some of the stuff now, and it looks really, really, really crass. And I think the same thing would eventually happen to that Palace and Gucci collab. I'd imagine. Who knows? I'm just an idiot. I don't know what I'm talking about. 
Early in the pandemic, Michele enlisted the director Gus Van Sant to create a short film set in his hometown of Rome, indulging his love for movies. When he was taken to task for lifting from the Harlem um, Cotier Dapper Dan, Gucci went into business with him, and it was during his tenure that the company launched a vault, an online resale project to rework treasures from the label's Jet Set Heyday and e commerce um, Imperium for the on the rise designers that won the seal of approval among them. Colleen Strada, Hilary Tamroy, whatever her name is, Bianca Sanders, and Rui Zhu. To be fair, the Dapper Dan stuff, as great as I think that was, there was a lot of pressure there. And I think you know, Gucci probably had to do the right thing, especially when you consider all the bad press that was happening around Dolce Gabbana. And I think that was also around the time RIP to flipping George Floyd when he was murdered, I'm pretty sure. So there's a lot of social pressure around for these brands to do a lot of recognizing of what you'd say minority voices in their overall brand legacy and success and kind of bringing them in and sort of kind of giving them jobs and helping them out that way instead of just kind of having them be you know customers on the outside in and not really taking part or contributing in any kind of meaningful way so as great as it was i kind of felt like their arm was twisted and they kind of were put in a position where they were sort of shamed into giving dapper down a role but i still like that he got the recognition regardless you know because the last thing you want is somebody like that when they're gone to then suddenly get their flowers but it was good to see them get embraced um dapper down especially to get embraced by the fashion industry you know now in real time and we could all see it and the record could reflect his most prolific collaborator was partner Giovanni Attili who drafted what have to be fashion's most scholarly if sometimes impenetrable show notes the full 2018 source material Donna Harway's cyborg manifesto helped produce one of Michele's most memorable shows for the house complete with models carrying life like replicas of their own heads the collection was a metaphor for how people construct their identities with the help of the machines and other non-natural editions we are the Dr. Frankenstein of our own lives Michele said at a time but he is the most human designer of these deeply ruminative romantic so anyway i'm not gonna read the whole thing but you get it you know some great ambassadors there lady gaga clearly wearing it and making it look amazing i'm just curious as to what happens next with someone like that if you're working at gucci for 20 years and you were the head designer there for flipping eight um nearly eight years what do you do now especially if it's it feels like you kind of got fired i don't know why because i felt like you know for once if there is a fashion brand out there where I believe the sale numbers, because for, for me, I'm one of those people that don't believe the sales numbers. I think they fob them a lot, um, similar to like the music industry when it comes to first week sales. I think there's a lot of fobbing and faking of the sales numbers, personally for me. Even if the companies are publicly listed, I just don't trust the numbers. I'm not too sure why. Uh, you know, Maybe because I live in a metropolitan city of London and I go out a lot and I don't really see a lot of people wearing the stuff that they purport to be selling a lot of. But if there's one brand I do see a lot of people wearing, especially regular schmegular people, it's definitely Gucci. I feel like Gucci has definitely done well in terms of you know, whatever influence or marketing they've done, whatever core factor that they have, people legitimately feel like wear Gucci the same way they wear Balenciaga in actual IRL. So I wonder if that being the case, if it was a firing, because why else would you let go of someone like that? Unless you legitimately fought for the higher up, because it seems that these board members have got their finger on the pulse. If they were able to pluck Flipping Alessandro from where was he working at? Accessories and give him that role um you know somebody that was completely unknown who had to do media training it shows that they got their eye on the ball so it's clearly a ball that knows well go on so maybe they were noticing the shifting sea change they were seeing how things were going like you know what let's get in front of this before this goes really tits up and let's get him out here now at the top or why is he's currently at the top sort of thing and then we can kind of move on that way because the last thing you want is your brand to kind of bleed dry and stagnate over a very short period of time you don't want to die you know from a thousand cuts you just want to you know uh, cut it off as soon as possible but i wonder what he wants to do next what would you do 20 years working for one brand and then eight years leading it do you go and start your own thing i don't know if that's really worth his hassle you know for as much as i'd like a lot of these guys to start their own thing but talking about starting their own thing where the hell was phoebe philo for instance what the hell happened to that return there was a big kerfuffle about that press releases getting her own namesake brand i think it was meant to be backed by lvmh if i'm not if i'm not mistaken and we haven't seen one iota of a real piece that kind of showed us that she's actually back so i wonder if you know the day-to-day -day struggle and hassle of being a designer the amount of resort like i said i was surprised it's only seven years he's been at gucci the amount of resort collections you do spring summer autumn winter capsule collections collaborations on top of it like it's just non-stop and again don't get me wrong he's not designing everything but he's still having to oversee things he's still having to choose things he's still having to set the tone set the pace approve this approve that it's a really consuming job it definitely definitely must be 
you probably must look forward to August so much every year, right? I think August is the month where all fashion people decide to kind of go and enjoy themselves and go to flipping nice exotic areas and kind of unwind and do nothing, you know, in terms of related to fashion. But I don't know, man, I wonder, will he want to come back? Will he want to just have a break and chill or maybe just turn into a quasi consultant and maybe do something like what Haida Edkemen is doing at the moment, which I feel like he kind of works behind the scene on a sort of hush hush basis, maybe consulting for some brands and working behind the scenes as a quote, a quote unquote ghost designer i wonder if you do the same sort of thing or maybe the attention and the adoration from people um in media and public is just too much and you can't turn that faucet off and you just want more and more of it he's going to get under that tap and start sucking on that celebrity tap and kind of put his own thing out who knows but um safe travels regardless on this next journey alessandro you did an amazing job at gucci i enjoyed watching your shows legitimately gucci shows are one of the only shows maybe apart from rick balenciaga and a few others that i and maybe gmbh that i actually watched i enjoyed watching the shows, maybe even prior to shows but for the most part he definitely had good shows i enjoyed every single one of them i love the fresh approach to mod to the casting i love that nothing was try hard the gender non-conformity just happened the casting being diverse was just a thing it wasn't part of that something that they're waving in the air they just kind of lived it they breathed it and i feel like the people that actually wore it and were kind of concord influencers and it really made the, the brand look even really really cool when they actually wore it so big up alessandro absolutely amazing work hopefully you're going to do bigger and brighter things going forward my friend and obviously we have to talk about mr raf simmons raf simmons deciding to close down his brand after 27 years 27 years absolutely crazy um it kind of came out the blue it felt like uh, because i just remember the other day he did a massive show at printworks here in london i remember a lot of people on my timeline were showing pictures of themselves at the show it looked pretty cool but i just remember thinking wow man imagine the amount of money they spent to flipping hire print works and get that done because imagine that's not a cheap place to hire even for a fashion show in the middle of the week or something it's not something that's gonna you know be a hundred quid or something on this side. it's not gonna be a thousand maybe a couple more zeros on there so to do a big show like that especially you know i think it was a show that they were meant to do prior if i'm not mistaken and i put in a queen down if i think so around that kind of so like a rescheduled show but still for a rational to do a show in london randomly um would cost a lot of money and would probably you know be the indication that your brand's doing pretty okay if you're kind of flying around and doing all these kind of on-site or kind of foreign destination shows or well, maybe it isn't because I felt like Bottega Veneta did the same thing, right? When they did a show in Burka and then soon after Daniel Lee got fired. So maybe it's kind of like a bit of a curse in fashion when you do these like location um, collections or the, these, sorry, these location shows like how Dior did recently the show in, in Cairo and Egypt. Maybe it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a bad omen to do those shows because soon after you're going to end up kind of shutting down. But this came out of the blue for me personally, because I always felt like, you know, Ralph Simmons has that weird thing where, Again, it's a thing, it's a brand that you don't really see a lot of people wearing out in real life, but it has a lot of cool cachet behind it. Um, it'll be, it obviously has a deep history in the fashion industry, especially when it comes to men's. It's in, you know, it's probably just set the trends and set the silhouettes for many, many, many years, especially post, you'd say, maybe Margiela. And I felt like maybe with the amount of people you see wearing on social media, maybe more archive pieces, the fact they don't see people wearing it in real life, it had this weird kind of draw where I felt like Ralph Simmons, for the most part, got away with maybe murder i felt like a little bit because i felt like towards the end the designs weren't as interesting as when he first started i felt like before he was really really you know pushing boundaries and setting trends every single collection sometimes very subtly sometimes it'd be you know again the riot collection everyone kind of knows and then it would be something very very subtle where there'd be a lot of kind of monotones there'd be very little branding there'd be very little quote-unquote streetwear it would be all tailoring the shapes and silhouettes would be amazing and just flip it again do something and those loads of kind of real kind of um really interesting ways of really presenting and showcasing masculinity but then i feel like over time it got a little bit repetitive especially recently and maybe the good indication of it being repetitive is i didn't really see as many people wearing the newer stuff as i saw wearing the old stuff so it kind of was a clear indication similar to bad example but bear with me similar to what happened to bape i feel like bape towards the end especially when it took over no one was wearing the new version of bape everyone was wearing stuff from prior like i did right like old snowboarding jackets old m65s old jeans old wallabies old denim jackets old you know um plaid shirts that was what they were wearing or multi camo shirts and stuff but they were always wearing the stuff that's happened that was kind of being made under the it tenure now, i don't know what happened again I, i'm always curious with this stuff because i think maybe raf simmons hasn't had the drop off as drastic as flipping ricardo tishi at givenchy or ricardo tishi sorry at burberry 
but I'm really curious to find out as to what happens. I'm, I'm sure people in the industry would know more so who are really close to this stuff, but what really happens when a supremely talented designer who at one point was doing amazing suddenly turns into, you know, something not amazing. Like, you know, the stuff that, you know, Ricardo Tucci was putting out of Burberry was legitimately offensive to his own legacy, not to us. To us, it was maybe offensive to our eyes. We could just close our eyes, but to his own legacy, considering how amazing he is, he should never be you know standing next to that and be proud of that that stuff was terrible it was garbage and i was like it's impossible how somebody so talented can produce something so terrible i didn't understand how that could happen and maybe rasimus wasn't drastic fall off but i did feel like recently the stuff wasn't as great so maybe it's not that great of a surprise but maybe off the, but still off the back of that print work show it still felt like it came out of the blue so you know i'm going to read a bit of this article here with um Vogue that kind of uh describes a bit more in detail it says here, Raf Seaman stunned the industry today when he announced his namesake label uh, official to Instagram account that the spring 2023 collection would be his final season. The show staged during London's Freeze Art Fair turned into a rave after the last model took their turn on the catwalk. Amazing. Simmons launched his brand in 1995 after working as a furniture designer and interning at the fellow Belgian Walter Van Beerdock's design studio. It's incredible, right? Two people who absolutely hated Virgil. Uh, Walter Van Beerdock and Raph Simmons. <laughs> the collection's funny. And they're also Belgian. If you know anything about the history of Belgium, Belgium and flipping Africa and especially Congo, you know why well, God. It's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> he quickly achieved cult status for youth oriented collections um that showcased his innate ability to distill inspiration from the underground art and music world into the um eminently recognizable mi minimalist silhouettes that's one thing i've just definitely given credit for um i was very late on the raf simmons wave because i guess when i came into fashion and got my interest in kind of you know wearing clothes and stuff which is weird because my introduction to fashion was like this guy called uh, matthew williamson who was an English designer who actually went to St. Martin's, the same college that I went to. And I remember reading about him before I went there and kind of went being like, oh yeah, that's the place I'm going to go to. I was like, oh shit. And I was kind of really into kind of following his sort of career in the early days of reading kind of British Vogue and whatnot. And then I remember obviously my introduction to fashion was sort of like mostly streetwear. So I kind of got into it via the kind of Comme des Garçons, Junior Watanabe sort of field and, you know, um, Undercover with flipping um, Jun Takahashi. And then that kind of introduced me to the fashion stuff. But I remember liking all the stuff from like Fragment early on, like maybe even Good Enough Times and whatnot, Neighborhood, and seeing all the bomber shapes and whatnot and be like, oh, I love this stuff. And then when I suddenly stumbled across Raph, I was like, oh, this is where it all came from. These silhouettes, these kind of like, you know, exaggerated shapes on the bombers, these t-shirt lengths, the graphics, it all came from him. He kind of set the template and the kind of, you know, um, the tempo and that sort of stuff. And obviously street with designers were able to take that and distill it in their own sort of way. But that was kind of my introduction. So I was never really fully into it. But if I, was, if I really was into it, it was mostly the archive stuff. All the stuff that you see all of these kind of, um, you know, uh, archivists, I guess you'd call them on social media that buy them stuff. I think there's a really famous guy, David something, who kind of, you know, sells people really limp, really rare Raf Simon piece. I think he was a person that may or may not have sold the Riot Bomber to Drake. Or is that story, did he sell it to Drake or did he get stolen? No, I think he sold it to Drake. I think he's the one that sold it to Drake or something like that. So he's a really kind of cool and um, really knowledgeable when it comes to all things considering Raf and yeah, all that stuff was really inspiring, but I, I remember just being more of a, let's say, of a Comme de Garçons person than I was of a Raph Simmons person. I didn't really, get, I got into Raph Simmons kind of quote unquote late. I maybe was more into Margiela, Raph Simmons, sorry, Margiela Com, and then I got into Raph towards the end. And then by the time I did get into him, because I was already obsessed with streetwear, I kind of just saw it as a bit reductive of what I was already wearing in streetwear. And really, he was the guy setting the trend. So it's really funny to see that kind of come full circle. Continues. His spring collection featured works by the late artist Philippe Vandenberg, and though he didn't know that at the time, they proved prophetic. Um, he said the following: "Cruel, they, their cruel words like kill them all, them. Their cruel words like kill them all and dance." But he didn't mean killing people the designer told Sarah Moa at the time. He meant killing things that are doing creatively in order to move on and exploit and explore further. He meant killing things that you are doing creatively in order to move on and explore further. In his Instagram post, Simmons wrote, I like the words to share how proud I am of all that we have achieved. I'm grateful for the incredible support from my team, from my collaborators, from my press, from buyers, from my friends and my family, from our devoted fans and loyal followers. Thank you all for believing in our vision and for believing in me. 
reached for comment P- simmons pr said that no on instagram would be the only official communication about his move <laughs> i love how press shy and reluctant he is to talk in general while explaining himself it's absolutely amazing sometimes you just you know go on for ages on live streams or whatnot sitting next to me you're proud and sometimes you just give you the cold shoulder and keep it moving love it at the top of his post he included the year 1995 when his label was debuted and the names of his parents alda and Jax and jacks the uh, same name as travis scott um, more crit- more cryptic are the phrases memory wear likely a reference to his spring 2015 collection whose clothes featured a collage of items from his childhood a kit in a roller coaster in national as well as images of his parents when they were dating and a station to station a 1976 david bowie album and the song that featured prominently in a movie christine f or christian f yeah that collection of christian f was ugh. That was one. Of, that was one of the harder recent ones, actually. That collection inspired by Christian. I think that was the one with the Parker that had drugs that you could kind of turn inside out, and all the all the models were walking on tables with like these flowers and bottles. Oh, a favorite designer of 2019. Bowie had been, long been a touchstone for Simmons. Um, there were there were T screen printed with the images of Aladdin Sane and his first collection, and his debut at Calvin Klein opened with Bowie's track "This Is Not America." The next time we'll see Simmons will be in January at Prada's menswear show in Milan. Um, he has been co-created director of the label since early 2020. So obviously there's an official communication there, um, which in a weird way looks really chic. Isn't it? Even though it's just black and white, it just looks really chic. I know it's not much and it's just standard font that you'd get on any kind of laptop or whatnot. But there's something about that that you could print on a t-shirt and that would look absolutely amazing also. But yeah, big up Raph Simmons. Um, I, I'm curious... I'm curious, really, really curious. I know this is a bit of a stretch. I understand this is a stretch. I get it. I know some of you will not like this, but I wonder if he kind of knew, and maybe this was the reason why he was a bit spicy when he said what he said about Virgil back then. You remember when he went through that whole thing and he was kind of, you know, basically throwing some bars and being a bit mean to Virgil and being a bit of a C-U-N-T. I wonder if back then he knew because fashion, I don't think there's any surprises especially in-house i think there's always people are aware of what's going on and the changing sea change and the nature of things and I, i'm assuming if you're a certain caliber of person you definitely see the attention that you used to get maybe being given to other people that maybe you feel like aren't as talented as you but you definitely feel, you definitely can be aware and you're kind of sensitive to things going around you so i wonder if back when what was this? This must have been 2017 when Raph said um, he wasn't inspired or excited by Bojabo's designs when he did that interview, but he called him a sweet guy, which is the legitimate worst compliment you'd ever like to get from somebody who looked at it as a design hero. I wonder if back then he was already noticing and seeing how things were changing in the industry and you're seeing that things were going in a direction where the things that he was lauded for in terms of his education, in terms of his experience, in terms of his references, in terms of his craft, in terms of his um, craftsmanship, in terms of his ability to pat and cut and all this kind of stuff and tailoring. I wonder if maybe he kind of saw that now it turned it into a thing where brands were looking for creative directors who could legitimately revamp the brand from top to bottom from the way the stores were laid out to how the sh- sh- shows were presented to who sat on the front row to who was you know maybe getting seated or sent p- products aware in certain places how they presented their shows digitally social media all this sort of stuff we kind of see it saw it change and it made them a little bit um what you say bitter and a little bit um resentful of things that were moving differently and maybe he was you know imagine you're raf simmons and now so, so suddenly in flipping meetings you're now being requested to open a tiktok account and stuff and post stuff on social media do instagram lives you're like what and now you're noticing the reason why they're asking that is because now these new customers you know they want more from their designers they want more from their brands they don't just want like you know clothes presented on fashion weekend with some notes and some buys and some weepy waves and the end of the show they want you to communicate and be you know, in their face or whatnot and answering questions, all this sort of stuff. I wonder if that was a thing that happened because I did think it was really strange that he said what he said because I'm. Th- th- this is a quote taken from this car article in 2017 and this is a quote from the GQ Style Magazine interview and the interviewer asked Raph Simmons the following. It's funny because there's like four lines here and he just says one word. He says the following the question. There are some designers now and I'm thinking of Virgin Abloh, like Off-White, Demner at Vetmar, Gosha Rojinski, Jesus Christ, man, Demner and Gosha definitely got bad reps now, who are connecting with the youth through fashion in a new way. Are there any young designers say that inspire or excite you? Yes. <laughs> you heard the name Virgin, it's like, Ugh. it continues. Anyone in particular? Not Off-White. <laughs> Which is funny because I think at the time that he did Off-White, 
I always said, weirdly enough, when he was doing it, I felt like the women's was way better than the men's. And I know that came soon, like that came much later, because I think for them when he first presented it was mostly men's. But I felt like off white necessarily it, it kind of felt a little bit all over the place. But maybe that's because he was trying to find his feet early off white. But I still felt like there was an clearly an idea of building a fashion house. He wasn't just trying to do a brand. He was legitimately trying to... I always had the idea that Virgil was trying to maybe emulate what flipping John Takashi was doing at Undercover. Because I feel like Undercover is sort of like that. It's kind of like a house or a label that has no real def defining theme that ties it all together. Maybe you could say futurism and sci-fi and maybe avant-garde. I don't know what you could describe it, but I feel like John, John Takahashi gets the uh, option to just start from a blank canvas every single collection that he puts together. There is no kind of theme that ties it all together. Maybe there is, I'm not looking close enough, but I think from early John Takahashi, from like the early scab gene collections and all this sort of stuff I used to check out back in the day in shooter magazines and stuff that he does on runways and collaborations he did with flipping you know, Uniqlo, they're all just kind of new, fresh stuff. Like just every season new but new stuff fresh stuff fresh fresh and for maybe Virgil tried to do the same thing and it's really difficult i'd imagine to do that every single season but maybe that also was why he didn't necessarily click or resonate with fashion elites and critics and people like raf because raf it's all about themes it's all about you know references it's all about um telling a story all this sort of stuff but John Takashi is just like the story is now whatever I'm showing you now that's a story then next season or next show it resets we go again so maybe that's the reason why I'm not being too sure but <laughs> this quote is hilarious anyone in particular not off-white he's a sweet guy I like him a lot actually but I'm inspired by people who bring something that I think has not been seen that is original that's not always about being in new new because who is new is new the funny thing he says that because they mentioned in this art in this question Demna and Gosha. And I'm a big fan of Demna. Everyone on this pod will probably know that I'm a Demna fanboy and Demna flipping at Vetamon was legitimately one of the most inspiring moments I felt like of fashion for me. It made fashion exciting. It kind of touched me in every single point away, especially with all the deeply intrinsic European references, especially at the time when I was obsessed with, you know, um, Eastern European and Central European motifs and history and culture and all that malarkey and you know, reading books about it, all this sort of stuff when them that burst on the field it kind of reminded me of old Margiela it kind of restored that feeling of old Margiela it was just really fresh and I really loved everything about it but let's be fair he wasn't exactly doing anything new 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 there's a lot of shirts a lot of bomber jacks a lot of hoodies a lot of jeans a lot of sneakers what was Gosha doing the same sort of thing maybe more sportswear maybe more aimed towards a younger market because clearly you know maybe he maybe allegedly allegedly does not you know <laughs> into that kind of stuff but it's i felt like it was really personal he said that because i don't feel like these guys were really that new if anything they were fresh and maybe brought a new energy but in terms of what they're presenting it wasn't anywhere that i felt like it was really pushing the mold pushing the fold or pushing things forward it was kind of just a maybe a fresh approach to sportswear in one sense with gosha and maybe a fresh approach to maybe demna to, to, to maybe margella and oversized kind of exaggerate proportions when it comes to that sort of stuff so i'm wondering if having left his brand after 27 years if he knew back then in 2017 that things were going to change he was already being pressured to do something he didn't want to do maybe he was you know he maybe overheard that somebody was going to overtake his label i don't know i don't know if that's a sake i just i just got a feeling there was more to it than meets the eye but maybe again i'm reading too much into it and it is just like a simple affair of you know the brand deciding or him deciding you know the fashion industry is a bit tiring after a while also i want to have a break i want to enjoy my time and of course he's already working you know doing the stuff at prada which has been getting absolute rave reviews and they've been absolutely crushed it every show that they've been presenting so clearly um that's going pretty well so why ruin it by doing all the other stuff or why you know why why do the other stuff if you can maybe survive with the product stuff especially at this stage of his life i'm sure he can you know he's not you know hurting for money in any way shape or form still really hard regretted but it just goes to show man how difficult and how tough the fashion industry is like if a label like Raf Simmons is closing down, maybe people would say, you know, Hyder Ekman maybe for me was the warning sign that things in fashion aren't all flipping rosy, how they make it seem to be. Because I thought Hyder Ekman's designs, although they were maybe a little bit challenging, maybe quote unquote, you'd say to the conventional consumer, which I don't think they were, because I don't think Hyder Ekman was presenting anything that was anywhere 
you know near it wasn't as it wasn't challenging as maybe a peter dode what he's doing now in terms of maybe it's stuff that maybe the general public wouldn't be too eager to jump on in terms of men's clothing because it kind of pushes the envelope um into a blurs a line between you know different kind of you know ways of presenting in terms of sexuality wise and whatnot but i feel like when it comes to Heide Aikerman, he was doing maybe the similar sort of stuff that what, you know, Heidi Slamane was doing at St. Laurent, maybe what he's doing now at Celine. So when Heide Aikerman ended up closing down, then it fell out to me, oh, that's a big sign. Something's happening in this industry. don't know what's going on behind the scenes because I'm not really deep into it like that. I'm just a fan from the outside, but it seems like to run a business, it's really difficult, especially, you know, post-pandemic, during the pandemic, it must be really hard and, you know, and then now you've got Raf Simmons, who I felt like another one also who kind of makes stuff that the regular person could is easily be into. You can easily see somebody with some disposable income just strolling into Selfridges or anywhere in West London and stumbling across a really nice Raf Simmons overcoat and be like, oh, this is nice. Not knowing who the designer is and it fits amazing. It's great material. It sort of just sits right. It makes you feel powerful and really kind of cool and hot and sex, whatever it may be. And now suddenly he's closing. So... I don't know. It shows, man, because I think Rassim was maybe the last sort of designer that exists in nowadays who's got the brand appeal or the appeal of the normies and the appeal of, you know, he's kind of got the overground, underground, as Virgil Abloh would say. And now he's having to shut down his brand. It shows that, you know, the industry is cutthroat, man. It's not easy out there. It really isn't easy. But anyway, he'll be fine. He's still got Prada. Prada's doing pretty well. The archive pizza is going to live on until, you know, for forever and ever and ever i see stuff still going full of like in the thousands when it comes to old raf simmons um you know you got lucas about recently he was stunting wearing some old archive raf that looked incredible 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 i actually put a picture up on that as well so you can see what that looked like he was absolutely stunning making that look amazing and he's a really good flag bearer for that the ian connor guy he's also somebody that kind of stunts a lot on that old old flipping raf simmons that makes that look so competing so if all those guys are out there still pushing you know the legacy and the flipping um archive of raf and there's archivists that exist obviously that's selling old pieces to celebrities and whatnot and that's still got a bit of cachet behind it i think sure it'd be okay recently i saw a picture of flipping what's his face of um drake taking a picture inside his you know massive walking wardrobe that looks like my whole entire apartment and if i'm not mistaken he was wearing a raf simmons riot bomber as a layering piece over another jacket like he was just wearing it just one like you know what you used to do back in the day you wear like a bomber you know underneath a massive maybe like an overcoat or something that's what he was doing with a flipping riot bomber jacket which at last showing i remember seeing going for like a hundred thousand on grail or something and maybe it's kind of sad maybe 50 grand but it's a 50 grand hoodie that he's wearing as a flipping car heart thermal you just imagine so clearly the appeal of raf simmons is going to live on and on so you know, it, maybe he might end his brand, but his influence will still live on forever. So big up Raf Simmons, and I'm eager to see what he does going forward. Also, I'm eager to see what he does going forward. Also, um, and then I think that's it. You know, I think that might be it of the show. I don't really want to waste too much of your time. Oh, actually, no. Let's talk about this actually quickly. Let's mention this. So, um, the last thing I want to quickly mention is the Denim Tears collaboration with Stussy. More so because I feel like this, this, this for me is what denim tears should be sticking with instead of doing the high fashion type of stuff i know the high fashion luxury stuff is maybe the position and area that most of these guys want to go in because you want to position yourself alongside the greats and you want to maybe um rewrite the narrative in terms of what people that look like me can kind of do when it comes to making clothes the ceiling isn't only in t-shirts and hoodies and whatnot i understand but i don't feel like there's anything beneath i don't think there's anything um I don't think there's anything uh, bad about being a really excellent streetwear designer, about the ability to be able to make stuff for everyday people that they can wear and that can make them feel luxurious and chic and whatnot. There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I don't feel like going over, you know, I don't feel like the grass is always green on the other side of these luxury collaborations. I feel like sometimes they essentially are using streetwear brands that or what I would deem to be streetwear brands more so for the clout and for the um real niche kind of audience that they have who clearly are really into what they do and buy everything that they release every sort of season but i feel like and obviously that obviously the people that have the flavor they have the culture in their hands they've got the kids in their hands and they kind of use that kind of for the most part and even though dior you know what refs what them tears that did at dior there's a lot of connections there because kim jones is intrinsically tied to the industry and streetwear and the scene and i'm sure tremaine and kim jones are somewhat 
friendly in terms of their kind of relationship with you know some intermediary people like maybe Virgil and stuff who maybe can tie them together or maybe other people that are connected to the industry overall but I felt like this collaboration that Denim Tear did with Dior was really bad like bad to the point where this is kind of on the level of like Palace and Gucci where this will eventually will end up at the bottom of the ocean somewhere strangling a turtle or it'll end up at TK Maxx somewhere because I don't feel like any of the stuff is really appealing in the slightest and will really go anyway in terms of kind of you know adding anything overall to the brand story that what them tears are trying to create it's incredibly forgetful it's incredibly plain if anything it kind of reminds me of something you would see from a collaboration with maybe uniqlo or something that's what it sort of feels like that kind of sort of vibe but it doesn't necessarily feel luxe it doesn't necessarily feel cool there's no real story being told here i don't feel like from what i'm you know there's no because i feel like when, when it comes to den and tears there's always a sort of intellectual element to it there's always a bigger sort of message that's kind of tying it all together or that's kind of underneath the clothing underneath the lady kind of have to strip away but i feel like just from what i see here i just see very derivative shapes and silhouettes and stuff that you could probably get from many other brands or many other high street stores for the most part i know that's kind of gross to say but i don't feel like it was any way exciting or any sort of interest in terms of really furthering what the MTS have done um going forward um, so I wasn't really a fan of it and I, I don't know I saw the show in Cairo also I thought that was very unnecessary for the clothes that they presenting it just felt like an incredible waste of time an incredible um, you know waste of resources everything just didn't seem right and if I'm not mistaken I didn't see any pictures of I don't know I wasn't following closely I've not really been on Instagram that much recently but I didn't see any images of Tremaine out there actually at the show itself so I don't know what that was all about it felt like what was it a capsule collection that came out of the blue um, I, maybe it's I won't say it's a bit too soon, but maybe in doing an entire collection, maybe it wasn't the best look. Maybe if there was a couple of um, pieces that were um, interwoven into the main collection, that might have made sense. Maybe this is a couple of bits. That's actually a bad indictment. If this is a couple of bits, this is a lot of bits. If this is a lot of pieces, a lot of SKUs included in this. I'm not necessarily a fan of this in the slightest whatsoever. And um, yeah, I didn't see him at the show. It felt a little weird. I just didn't like it at all whatsoever. The shoes I thought were horrible also. Um, just for me i felt like like look at these that's definitely a what are those moments right these are these kind of court shoes with this fabric on the outside which i'm sure is incredibly luxurious and fabulous looking but they look incredibly horrible like and to be honest i've never liked this logo this print i gotta be honest this sort of like dior um double stamped everywhere it kind of reminds me of that you know when you get receipts and or i don't know it's receipts and it's all stamped all over i don't know it's something really weird about it it doesn't sit right with me it doesn't look right it doesn't looks symmetrical i don't know it's something i just don't like about it. i'm not really a fan of that logo in the slightest whatsoever you know you got the so you got the dior thing at the back i don't know for me personally not the biggest fan of sneakers i think the entire thing was horrible but the stussy collab is really good and i feel like it's what they should be concentrated on doing when it comes to denim tears i feel like this really does tell more of a story for what denim tears are doing you got that i think jamaica avenue um logo here sign i think maybe he's from them i'm not too sure um but just everything about it the casting the shoot itself how the pieces look you got this nice amazing crochet tote bag looking thing that goes I've, for me personally again this is a this touches my soul because i've always been a real stickler where whenever i buy tote bags usually or whenever i get give tote by who buys them whenever i get free tote bags what i usually do is i slip off the the straps and I connect the straps on either end on the opposite side so that it kind of creates a more of a longer strap that you can put cross body. Because I feel like whenever you wear, especially being a big guy like myself, I feel like you can't ever wear tote bags in a chic way. I feel like you can only wear a tote bag chic over your shoulder like a handbag if you've got a very slow, you know, um, slim or, um, yeah, very narrow kind of shoulder. And obviously I've got big sort of, a, you know, flipping lamb patty, flipping shoulder. So it doesn't really sit that well. So the best way to wear, I feel like a tell is to snip off the hand, the straps on either side and sort of tie them where you can stitch them together and maybe you kind of make them short if you want to with a hairband or whatnot. And then you can sling it over the top like a sort of like a messenger bag type style thing. And I like what they did with this crochet bag, similar sort of vibe. So I love that. And obviously it's in the same colors, if I'm not mistaken, as that, da as that David Hammond's um, American flag, if I'm not mistaken, is that the same colors? I think so. Maybe not. But I also really, 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 really like the the Reef logo with the Stussy on it. I think that's with the double S's. There's a kind of shadowing, I feel like, underneath it. It looks really cool. Let's see if I find the picture. But I feel this logo looks absolutely incredible, like this, with this kind of um, border around it or this kind of drop shadow 
on the outside it looks absolutely beautiful i think this sits really really well and you know the color of the wash of the dome jacket is always perfect that cardigan looks really great also let's scan back here you've got a really nice um half zip with jamaica queens on there i think that's where he's from if i'm not mistaken there's a nice crochet belt on there that looks amazing these pants look great these reminds me of something that my mum would have maybe got in terms of fabric and made into a dress they're like a combat cargo type style pant but just you know what you'd expect from stussy in terms of really nice um outerwear and pieces kind of with the with a little sort of eccentric spazzes and sprinkling of denim tears magic and even this denim jacket this camera jacket with the slits um pockets here towards the chest which i'm a big fan of i love a good uh, chest slip pocket it kind of reminds me of an old um you know um, army surplus jackets i'd get in the army and navy down the road from where i live i love that kind of effect i think i've got a jacket now at the moment a capital um, an angland store one that i've been wearing recently i think you might have seen on my instagram where i'm wearing it and it's kind of got these nice slip pockets at the top that look really amazing but i'm a big fan of that type of pocket length um, i think you find them a lot in m3b jackets also but i love this effect on it um the fact that it does have a hood is also a nice little change because you know this sort of camo jacket for the most part you usually get like you know annoying um have what they call them epaulets on the shoulders usually get a massive hood but i like the fact that it's got this nice wrangler and sleeve on the shoulder here which is nice kind of curves in and then you've got this if i'm not mistaken corduroy looking um collar which kind of reminds me of something of a barber and it looks sort of insulated as well on the inside maybe there's a there's a padded jacket on the inside nice big pearl buttons for the most part the denim as well is nice and then you've got of course this balaclava with obviously the if i guess it's jamaican colors i'm not sure if it's jamaican avenue of the david heavens but the guys it's mostly black and then you've got red yellow and green here towards the bottom but they look really really fantastic and really really cool again nice um card i guess it's like a cardigan type by this thing underneath this knitwear piece which looks amazing but that bag is definitely going to be something i'm probably going to keep my eye on and eventually end up trying to purchase because i really really love that but like i said prior i think this stuff is way better than the stussy collaboration look at that t-shirt even oh, come on man that looks incredible the pants look nice is that, that is that, oh it's not it looks like a zip cardigan wow the massive hood that looks really cozy so yeah i don't think there's anything wrong with being really good at presenting streetwear type items at this type of level because i feel like this is way for me personally me personally speaking this is way more luxurious and way more chic than anything that he did with dior i feel like the dior stuff wasn't that great maybe this this overall look is really fresh and nice but the rest of it is not really that interesting doesn't necessarily tell any interesting stories or present any interesting propositions it's just a kind of derivative kind of you know repetitive or stuff that you maybe have seen kim jones present already at dior in some way shape or form but there's nothing that really kind of speaks to me in any kind of meaningful way to be honest there's nothing really that great here even the logo on this doesn't look that great compared to what he did here with stussy i feel like this this logo here is way way better especially you know juxtaposed next to that david hammond's flag there on the side that looks absolutely incredible but yeah i'm a big fan of this i think this looks really incredible when's the actual date of it being released let's scroll down to the hypebeast article it says oh it's actually coming out this friday so select locations of dover street are going to have it stussy are going to schedule to launch the entire collection come friday it's probably all going to sell out so keep an eye on it if you haven't already it looks absolutely banging that has been the agassino zinga show episode number six to eight thanks again for tuning into the show it's been a pleasure to have your company if it's the first time checking me out you know what to do smash the like hit subscribe and all that malarkey if you listen to the podcast app all you have to do is click the main website link in the description if you want to find out more information regarding myself that's www.agassinozinga.com you can find information regarding the patreon regarding my social media links regarding the podcast itself the youtube channel all that good stuff my dj stuff everything you want to find out regarding more my blog you can find it at www.agassinozinga.com um and then that's it really and i've got nothing else to really kind of update you guys on apart from that so thanks again for tuning in i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe listen to the audio podcast you'll find my tune of the day playing for you just underneath my voice here you can probably hear faintly coming in and then you hear it kicking when i say peace so peace <laughs>